Hey you guys, welcome back to Michael Claire to Arts. Man, what a fun, fun weekend we just had. It, of course, coming off the Christmas season, you know, that time of reflection, that time of realizing that you ate too much over the weekend, too much of Christmas, being around family. It's always, always one of those times when you just kind of need to take a moment. Taking a moment, that's important. Um... Today we're going to be doing some face drawings. Uh, I'm more or less a creature guy. You know, I do creatures and animals and characters and uh, that whole genre. I don't get tasked too much to do realistic looking portraits um, or realistic looking uh, illustration. You know, I can do it. It's something that I have done. And, you know, that's kind of my roots. I really started doing portrait painting and portraiture and caricature and I don't it's not that I didn't enjoy it it's one of those things where you know I, I thought that my skill set really lend itself to storytelling uh, with uh, stylized characters so that's where I usually lie we will do some stylization today it's not going to be too realistic but we will be doing faces and heads and you know this is kind of like a warm-up session um, I'll be working in Clip Studio Paint today and that is a piece of software that I Love, I love Clip Studio Paint, and in the midst of doing the drawing and explaining what I'm doing, I will be kind of explaining Clip Studio Paint. So you're gonna kind of get a two for one, a two for one today. So you know, understanding software is one of those things where it takes time to learn it, and sometimes we get frustrated. I know I sure as did, heck did, man. When I first started using Photoshop and Illustrator, I was one of the most frustrated individuals in the classroom because I didn't have a lot of experience on a computer. You know, I really wanted to be, quote unquote, a traditional uh, a traditional pencil uh, animator with pen and paper or pencil and paper. And I thought to myself, why do I need to get into computers? I wasn't really a gamer. And the whole idea of sitting down in front of a computer and using software, it was a tool that I wasn't really prepared for mentally, emotionally, and man, did it work against me for the first, you know, probably year of using it. And then after that, I had, you know, that particular, because it was in school, I did my little school uh, stint uh, with uh, digital software. And then I was like, screw software and digital. That's, I'm not going to do any of it. And I realized later on, I kind of shot myself in the foot because the first job that I got was a graphic artist uh, slash illustrator um, uh, for an apparel company, um, Foot Locker. I, I worked, that's the, my first job basically for Foot Locker and for Foot Locker Corporate and designing apparel and, and, and you know, assets. And I basically, gosh, I, I kind of wiggled my way in. Yeah, I know Photoshop. Yeah, I know Illustrator. I know those two programs like the back of my hand. And it took me a good two weeks um, on the job of embarrassing myself and finally realizing that the digital tool was exactly that. It was a tool and I needed to learn how to use it. And since then, I've got a little bit better at it, I think. <laughs> I've built an entire career on digital illustration and only now, after I've I've been in the market for quite a long time, do I realize the importance of the digital tools and how adding a new piece of software to your to your skill set and to your uh, skill belt that belt that art utility belt that we constantly change throughout our career and our lives. It's it's important that uh, you know I, I I constantly evolve, and that's one of the things that you know is really big on my channel evolution of you as an artist you don't want to get stuck in that mire stuck in that that little hole and you know you kind of push everything else aside and this is the way i do it this is the way that i want to do it and i'm i'm going to do it until you know the day that i uh, move on and i think that uh adding a piece of software like clip studio paint especially if you're a photoshop user or illustrator user or you know fresco user or one of those programs that uh you know, made by Adobe. Adobe seems to have the corner on a lot of software. Now, just so you know, there are alternatives to Photoshop and the Adobe Creative Suite that really are inexpensive, and Clip Studio Paint is one of them. You can routinely find Clip Studio Paint for $30 and under. I think it retails for $60 or $65, and this is not a plug for Clip Studio Paint. I just like using it. This is not a review. They're not, they're not paying me any money. Um, 
you know, where Photoshop, and I think Clip Studio Paint went to a subscription model recently and everybody threw up their hands. Well, that's it. The world's coming to an end. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, it's confusing. I don't know why these companies need to make things confusing um, for the users concerning subscription models, but I don't like paying. I'm already getting nickel and dimed for all the subscriptions that I have for entertainment. Good grief. I don't even want to go into, you know, from Disney Plus to Discovery Plus to Paramount to Peacock to all those. Let the madness stop. Anyway, so we're going to get into Clip Studio Paint today and learn a little bit about what the program is. You know, I talked about the alternatives to Adobe. You have Krita and Medibang, which I've used Krita. And there's a really awesome tool in Krita. And I think I need to do a review about it. It's the perspective tool, drawing tool. I love that tool. So... We're going to get into Krita at a different video, so stay tuned. Like and subscribe, please. Um, you haven't even seen anything, and I'm already asking for a like and subscribe. I'm so sorry. Uh, anyway, so let's go ahead and get into Clip Studio Paint, and we're going to we're gonna draw and talk and talk about um, career stuff and, you know, just sit back and enjoy. I always encourage you to grab a cup of coffee, or if you're sitting there drawing, I encourage you to put some headphones on as you listen to me um, kind of narrate different aspects of my career and story and telling and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. And here we are inside of Clip Studio Paint. I run the Clip Studio Paint EX version. And I know that there's two versions um, that you can utilize. And I believe one of them I think it's the pro version or it might be the EX version. It might be the EX. That's the next level up. And you get a lot of templates and you get, let me see, media color pattern, background, monochromatic materials. You get different. Yeah. You get a whole bunch of comic related templates and stuff. And actually I don't I don't use comic templates or anything like that because I'm not a comic book artist, but Go ahead, if you're interested in this particular program, after I utilize it, it might behoove you, behoove you to do some research because this program is pretty awesome as I completely mess up my desk here. Um, I did have a couple issues, uh, I believe in the last video, pertaining to my Surface device that I'm working on. I'm working on a Surface Laptop Studio. And I believe because I'm running OBS Studio, it's taking up a lot of the RAM resources. So just know that a lot of times we'll get into a program and we'll start utilizing it and we'll add all these peripheral items, especially in a PC environment. And the processor and the graphics card can't deal with it. So that's, you know, I was using Photoshop whenever I was having all the issues. So I'm, I've switched to Clip Studio Paint to hopefully determine if that was the issue, right? It's probably user error, which means it's my fault. Okay, so I've opened Clip Studio Paint. I went over here to the left-hand side in the tabs, very similar to Photoshop. You click these icon letter or words and it brings up a sub-menu. Actually, these are tabs up here and it brings up a sub-menu that has a lot of options. That has the potential to frighten you. And I think that you need to go into this knowing that you're going to fail. It's going to be hard and it will take time. Do a little bit at a time, have little successes. And as you build those successes, your confidence will raise, which actually will draw you, <laughs> pun intended, draw you to the program. I first got into Clip Studio Paint because a really good buddy of mine said, man, you got to try this program. It's the bombs. And I'm like, I don't need another program, homie. I got Photoshop and I got Sketchbook Pro and I got whatever else I was using at the time. And he said, no, you really need to go in and just experiment a little bit because this program is great. The rendering engine's really good. It's got a ton of really cool uh, settings and you can do macros and and I'm like, fine, I'll look at it. And so I did, and lo and behold, he was right. Which, you know, listen to your friends, because a lot of times they're right. Um, and I was just floored at some of the really cool features that it has. Uh, and one of the guys that uh, actually, um, one of my buddies uh, that uh, work buddies, you have actual friends, and then you have internet friends, and then you have work buddies, and then you have work friends, and you have internet work buddies art buddies. So I'm going to call this guy just an acquaintance. You know, he and I have talked quite a few uh, times on the phone. 
and he is really dedicated to the Clip Studio Paint um, environment, and he's had uh, an uh, extremely illustrious career uh, working in this program, and he's really good at it. He's created macros, brush sets. I mean, it's just really awesome. Um, and uh, you're like, well, who is it, man? It's uh, uh, Brian Allen, uh, uh, Flyland Designs. He uh, He's done so much in the marketplace, uh, especially he's really, you know, he does pinball art and just really had a lot of fun uh, building his clientele and I'm so happy for him gosh you know you watch people go from once one particular area and then they've really built over the past seven eight years uh, an incredible clientele and go give the guys some love Brian Allen look him up he's uh really a premier uh, illustrator um doing stuff uh gosh for Williams pinball and and he does stuff for Gosh, his style is so eclectic. Just look him up. You'll you'll understand. So Clip Studio Paint, what am I doing? Uh, over here on the right-hand side, you can see that you've got very similar setup. You have the tools right here, very similar to Photoshop. And this is a sub-tool uh, menu because I've got a particular tool selected over on the left-hand side. Here's the layers. Here's a layer of properties, which I don't get too into. And here's the navigator, very similar to Photoshop. And, you know, it also saves as Photoshop files. So if you work in this particular program, you can export a Photoshop file with layers and effects uh, and open it up in Photoshop if that's your preferred area, which it is my preferred area. I work mostly in Photoshop because I, I like the interface. I like the quick keys um, and I've basically built up my muscle memory uh, inside of Photoshop. And I do use, like I said, Clip Studio Paint quite a bit, but not as much as Photoshop. So, but a lot of the quickies are very similar in Clip Studio Paint. So those of you who are working in Adobe Photoshop, you can really translate over into Clip Studio Paint very easily. So over here on the left-hand side, you see these tools, move tool, Selection area tool, the uh, operation tool, some of the tools that I don't really use. <laughs> Move, uh, zoom in and out. And I utilize this tool right here, which is a quick key pad. And I program certain quick keys in here so I can do things really quickly um, on my Surface Laptop Studio. And because the keyboard is underneath the screen and whenever it folds down, the screen actually completely covers up the keyboard. So I've utilized uh, devices like this on many Surface devices and it uses a dongle in the back right here. It's about $45 total. And I've used this probably for the past four years and it's held up fantastic. Um, over here on the left-hand side, uh, you have all the tools. You can go in and you know examine those and you see these little lines right here. I call, you know, these are typically um, like action tools. These are your brush, uh, your brushes. So you go from pen and you're like, well, nothing's coming up. That's because you have to expand the uh, subtool menu. So the subtool, this will be a sub, this will be a tool, the subtool menu. You go in, you select the pen, and then it's got different um, tools on the inside, diff different brushes and whatnot. So you see that I've got a lot. Those don't come with... Um, Clip Studio Paint, uh, I've actually uh, installed a ton of brushes. So what you're seeing is not typical, but you do get a nice selection of brushes in Clip Studio Paint. And you can see I can go in and uh, what's really cool is like if I have rough pencil, because you know I like it rough. So I'll double click on this. <laughs> you got to keep it funny, right? Um, you click on this and you can see as I change the tool, the tool property menu changes for each particular tool so you can customize your brush. So right here, rough pencil, you can see brush uh, size, density, texture. You can change the texture density. It's got stabilization on it, which I don't like. Why is that stabilized? I don't like stabilization because it, it dumbs down and it steals system resources. So we're going to make that zero. And... Whenever you click this little uh, reset select tools, it'll reset every aspect of that particular uh, tool slash brush. Um, so it goes to default. And if you really want to get in there, you're like, holy crap, you text it's this little wrench deal down here. You go to ink. You can change the opacity 
by pin pressure and tilt. So I want you to look at this for a second. Okay, this is important to note. So we started out on the left hand side. We have pencil. You're like, well, that's cool. I got the pencil and you know, I can select it and I'll start using it. And But it just doesn't feel right. Something's wrong. I, I just don't get it. You know, every time I touch the brush and the, the pencil, I want to, you know, it to work with me, not against me. Well, that's what's great about Clip Studio Paint. Very similar to Photoshop. You can go in and manipulate the tools and adjust them and customize them and it automatically saves. And at the end of the day, if you want to, let's say, save the brush, you can save the brush in an area uh, for later use. Um, or uh, if you want to export it, you can export the brush and you can create brushes uh, on your own. So we selected the tool. We went to the uh, sub-tool menu. We selected rough pencil. It brought up the properties after I touched, um, you know, this, this little menu right here came up. And then I touched the wrench, which brought up this menu right here, the subtool detail. So it's like a step process. This is very indicative of software in general. Um, they want you to the user to have maximum access to uh, the capabilities of the program. So then you come in here and you can you can literally change every aspect of this brush. And uh, you know. You can, like I said, save it the way you want to, and then you click this. And each one of these has a little, like a little sub menu. You can go. You can change the blending mode. So I don't want to overwhelm you right now because you know we're drawing and having some fun. So right now the brush is set up the way that I like it, and you know that might not be the way that you like it, and that's perfectly fine. You can do whatever you want, and. Uh, save the tool how you want to. Now I'm using, um, like I said, uh, Clip Studio Paint on my Surface Laptop Studio and I am using the uh, screen. I'm not uh, attaching a tablet or anything to it. So I'm using the Windows uh, stylus. This is the Windows stylus. I've got numerous styluses for this particular uh, device. And I think that the Windows stylus pairs the best, in my opinion, the best with this machine. It's specifically designed for this machine, and the updated, uh, the updated software algorithm and hardware digitizer on the screen. I don't really get any parallax, and the only time I really had an issue was whenever I was using too many resources and it was bogging down the system and my touch went away and my pen went away. And I'm pretty sure that's because it was utilizing resources to render the video that I had just shot on the machine. So just remember that this particular machine is kind of in the midway. I don't buy really super high end machines because I'm cheap and I don't have the money to afford stuff like that. I mean, honestly, four or five grand for a <laughs> for an all-in-one three grand for an all-in-one i ain't made of cash yet holmes so i definitely um get something in the mid-range and i go from there so as i progress through you see that i started out with a simple sphere it's important to know that i don't call it a circle and you're like well why don't you call it a circle it's a circle this is a circle it's a circle dude now, in, in my brain, whenever I'm drawing, uh, especially if I'm drawing something that I want to have depth and form, it's important to know that whenever I draw, I'm not thinking two-dimensionally, which is height and width. I'm thinking three-dimensionally, which is height, width, and depth. Um, you have to think in terms of that... Uh, mental idea if you want to quote unquote draw something that looks real you ever have somebody that that says some something like that to you it looks so real it's it's just so real looking i just i want to touch it yeah and that's that you know that has to do with understanding how your brain works and how we see things um in three-dimensional space we see things in three-dimensional space with depth and perspective and relationship and all of those things. And whenever we go to draw on a 2D surface, which doesn't have that, let's be honest, it's only height and width. And you you can't put your 
hand into the screen and touch things like this. Wouldn't that be awesome? That would be awesome. So you have to think in your brain and how your mind's eye will see the world. So that's what I do. I draw a sphere. That was a long explanation for why I draw a sphere. And I'm thinking height, width, depth. I'm thinking that it has volume. It has form. There's a back to it, a side, and a height, and a width to it. And whenever I start drawing that way, I'm not drawing, per se, lines. And you're like, you're full of crap, man. You're drawing lines. I can see them. They're all over the freaking screen. Yeah, but I'm not really doing that. I'm sculpting. I'm sculpting the drawing and how I perceive the curvature, the relationship, and how I'm basically, it's its like my, my eyes have hands. <laughs> That'd be interesting. Your eyes don't have hands, you freako. Yeah, they do, and and I'm wrapping my eye hands around you, <laughs> around the screen and around the drawing itself. And it's sometimes hard for me to explain that, especially whenever I'm teaching. I'm like, take your your arm, your your eye hands, and wrap them around the the smallness of of the toes as you sculpt things. And it's you know drawing, it's hard to explain, and that's why drawing. And I explain this to people. Drawing is hard. Just seeing things is hard. And that frustration that we all seem to get whenever we can't do things instantaneously. Why can't I draw a perfect square instantaneously the first time? I know what a square looks. And that you know what? I think that's really what we as people get frustrated at. Whenever somebody says, just draw it. Doesn't that make you angry? It makes me angry when somebody's like... Just draw it. You can see it. Just do what you see. The thing that that I get frustrated at is we're all at different levels. Our brain capacity has has different levels of understanding, different levels and experiences. And we're all different. And that's, I think, one of the great things uh, about human beings in general is we are all different. So we think, see things different and we perceive things different. And that is... You know, how we solve problems. You have somebody that will look at a square and say, you know, that's a square. It's perfect. And then you have another person that, that sees it and says, you know, that's terrible. That's not a square. That's a rectangle. What are you on, dope? And yeah, I think that uh, we as people need to recognize that art is beautiful and we all conceive and perceive things a little bit different, right? That's why whenever you get some, I had a very interesting discussion with some students once because I had to really explain to them that, especially in the world of art, there is no right and wrong. And this is going to probably stir up some things uh, in the in, in my channel. There's, there's not really a right and wrong whenever it comes to, quote unquote, creating art. Art is an expression. It is an expression. And the lines and the forms and the paintings and, and the color and the lack of color and all of it is an expression of humanity. So you could basically say that, you know, anything is art. Anything that people create is art. And then you say, well, what about Mother Nature? Yeah, Mother Nature, that can also be considered art because it is created. And, you know, a beautiful sunset. I love that. It is so gorgeous. Look at the gradients. And that is, of course, um, an expression of what you see of how, you know, light refracts and reflects and <laughs> all of those things. So basically what I'm trying to say is art, as, as we see it, is an expression and it should be viewed as such. You know, you can like it and not like it. You can judge it and not judge it. You can say, oh, it's art. It can't be judged. But the thing is, there is that median standard of what people view as being, you know, beautiful and not beautiful. See, there's a difference between what we would perceive as being art and something that we as individuals perceive as being beautiful. So, you know, whenever I had the discussion, I had to explain to them there is that acceptable norm of what the average median of humanity accepts as being art. And that's where we as as artists that make money live. You have people that, you know, work outside of that genre that create artwork. And then you look at it as being extraordinary and, you know, uh, revolutionary. And then you have the, the other side of the equation, which is disgusting um, or horrible. And 
that is just something that we need to realize, uh, especially if you're here to make money at it, is there is that zone where, you know, you have all these quote unquote rules that pertain to art and drawing. So the, the elements and principles of design, you know, I talk about form, I talk about all of those items, uh, form, line, weight, expression, all of those things pertaining to art because, you know, we as people have to have a validation for what we're doing and we just can't say, you know, it looks wonderful. We have to go in and say, oh, I love the line weight that express is so expressive and the and the motion and the expression of the of the character or you know the the box of matches on the table with with the with the shadows going over it it's so gorgeous and you know we we as people we need to have that explanation and that's completely fine and we as as uh, artists that make you know money doing this and getting paid and and whatnot we have to look at that and kind of adhere to some of those quote-unquote rules and i'm like i don't want a rule i don't like rules well you know whenever you have an art art director that is directing you and paying you to do something then suddenly you do have rules and trust me some of them suck some of them suck and you know you're like well i don't want to do that it looks terrible well, you're not the one making the, uh, you're not the one writing the check. So, yeah, it's like the bastardization of uh, your expression. And soon you realize that the wonderful birthing of the creation that you made is no longer yours. It is sold. You sold it. And the person paying the, you the money, because it's an exchange and it's a business, they have creative control. You are just a tool. Okay, so now that was a long expression to show you that um, there are certain quote-unquote rules pertaining to artwork whenever you're making money at it. You know, balance, line, um, line weight, form, value, color, texture, all of these words that we recognize that we... Uh, you know, we think we understand. You're like, I know what texture is. Texture is the, the tangible feeling or look of something that has some type of roughness or smoothness uh, to it. And, you know, how do I get that into a 2D drawing whenever I'm drawing something? And, and that is, of course, you know, you as artists and people of intelligence understanding what you're doing. You know, what am I doing? I'm creating... Uh, an expression of uh, of my brain, and I'm translating stuff from my idea uh, into uh, some type of picture that we can, you know, acknowledge and, and review. And that's basically, you know, in terms of how you go about explaining what you're doing. So if you ever have somebody that comes up to you and it's like, it's so beautiful, you know, and then my, I always like to ask, well, why is it so beautiful? You know, why? And I always like to hear them say what their, you know, what their idea of what I did is. And it's, it's always good for you to also accept, um, you know, even if you don't respect, see, there's accept and respect <laughs> whenever it comes to art reviews, uh, you know, and somebody that has more experience, obviously is going to pull more weight whenever it comes to reviewing a piece of art. But honestly, anybody can review art. There is not a doubt in my mind because they're looking at it from their perspective and their point of view. Um, and is it quote unquote uh, respected? I can respect a five year old looking at my drawing and going, I don't like it. And you're like, well, you're just five years old. You don't know anything. Well, a lot of times um, I think whenever we grow up, we lose that perspective of the easy read, right? The easy read. I talk about the easy read in my class. You know, the easy read being what I see in the first few seconds of viewing a piece of artwork. You know, is it something that I enjoy? Is it something that I like? Did I see it from afar? Do the colors make me feel pleasant or upset? And that easy read, a lot of times children can pick up on it very quickly. They, they can pick up body expression. They can pick up things that you know, adults maybe have grown used to and no longer can see, right? Children can feel 
things a little bit different than, and it's instantaneous. You ever, you ever, you know, child, children are like right on the edge between crying and being super happy. <laughs> so a lot of times whenever a child, uh, you know, a young child, especially looks at your artwork and they look at it and, and maybe they get super excited because it's colorful and it's a character ha, ha, that they see, gosh. And, you know, a Mickey Mouse and, you know, then you, you show them something a little bit more edgy that they're, you know, not used to. And, you know, that comes into play where uh, uh, shape language comes into play and manipulating your viewer's eye to really uh, see what you want them to see. Um, we had a recently my wife, uh, she did a presentation where she showed one of those pictures from the 1990s, you know, those pictures that were three dimensional and you had to like cross your eyes, you know, a little bit like this and you had to look at them and they were three dimensional and you could see an image that was inside of all this gobbledygook <clears throat> and it took a moment and I always thought those were so fascinating. You know, first of all, they were gimmicky, but it forced the viewer to, to, to do something they weren't used to for one. And also it, it really, the artist was in control. You know, if you didn't see it, that, that wasn't the artist's fault. You know, that was your fault for not, for not, uh, you know, slowing down or doing it the way that the artist wanted you. It kind of forced you into that box. And I remember whenever I would stand in the mall and I would look and I would see the people standing at it and they were like, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't see it. It's so sad. And then people get so mad. And then you would have these kids that would come along. There it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. And it was so funny because the kids would go in and they would basically do it instantaneously because they were understanding and accepting that it took a little bit more to cross that threshold. Whereas adults were kind of set in their ways. It was always fun to watch. So what I'm doing is just going in and I'm putting in that roadmap. We all, I think we all, it's safe to say that we all have cell phones now, um, which is not necessarily a great thing. I'm not really a huge fan of the cell phone generation. Um, what I'm doing is putting in what's called a roadmap. A roadmap is a guide for me to illustrate. Whenever I first sit down to do a drawing, you saw me, I started out with a sphere. I moved on and I started placing elements according to what my mind's eye saw. And the elements, of course, being a face, we can zoom out. We can see that. I had in my brain, I wanted kind of a forward facing, kind of a three quarter view. And I started working on that. Now, my knowledge of not only uh, drawing, but also uh, understanding form, value, line weight, all of that comes into a feeling. And whenever I'm first sketching things out, I'm creating that roadmap. I want the expression a certain way. And I am open to happy accidents, just like Mr. Bob Ross says, the happy accident. But also, <clears throat> I am adhering to some of those quote unquote rules, um, you know, balance, form, weight, posture, anatomy, anatomy of a human being, um, where eyes are, where your head lies, where your eyes are placed on your head, where your brow line is, where the muscular structure of your cheekbones are. I'm adhering to those as I draw and I'm doing it in such a way that I'm not doing it line itemization. It is a flow, a rhythm and flow that, uh, creates that roadmap that eventually after I get done with the roadmap, because it happens really fast, the roadmap. Now, obviously this happened, this is happening a little bit longer because I'm talking and, and yakking on about life and, and art and stuff like that. But overall, this process, sketch process, seven, six, seven, eight minutes. I mean, really quickly because I'm, I'm pushing and I'm pulling and I'm feeling with my hands and I'm wrapping my eye hands around that form and feeling and pushing things the way that I want them. And eventually whenever I find, you know, oh, the sketch is where I want it to be, then I will stop and I will start uh, refining. And that refining process is when I allow my brain to switch gears. It switches gears and now I'm going back to the technical side and I'm, and I'm, oh, the eye's a little bit too low. Oh, the beard's a little bit too fluffy. Oh, the lip's a little bit too, you know, short, small. Maybe I want the eyebrow to go up. Maybe I want the eyebrow to go down. 
And that is the fra uh, phase that I think some people mess things up because they get too technical. I'm not tracing the drawing. I am uh, evaluating, reevaluating, and placing things where I think they need to be. Okay. So as you see, again, just a stylized head. Pretty simple. Okay. Trying to place things where they are. I think this eye is a little bit too high. So I have that come down just a little bit. And I've got the eye socket. It comes up and around. You can see that I kind of drew the eye socket right here. And I placed that eyeball. That eyeball is about that big. You can see these things as I draw them. Little visual cues. Little lines that are placed in certain areas that I want them to be. You know, expressing things. Having that rhythm and flow. Okay, so we're going to have that come around. We're going to have that neck right here, maybe a shirt. Here's the Adam's apple right here. And that muscle comes down. Got that neck muscle right here. Trapezius. The lats comes around here. Okay, and it is good to know uh, anatomy. You know, you don't have to quote unquote know all the muscle names. But it is good to help you as you progress through your journey, your art journey, to be better and better at what you do. And of course, uh, understanding and knowing those uh, muscles will definitely help you. So let's go ahead and scroll down. You can see, like I said, I've got a lot of brushes. Let's go to color pencil. Okay. Put a little bit of value in here. So that texture is a little too smooth. So as you see, let's go here and I can go to texture. Okay, actually it doesn't have a texture to it. That's interesting. I'm sure I'm doing something wrong. Hmm. Anyway, so what I do is I'll make it really big and you can see it does have a little bit of a spray texture to it. So what I do is I go in and I just start putting in some value, right? So a lot of people ask me, well, how do you determine where the light and shadow is? How do you determine the value? Value is uh, light and dark, the intensity of, and then you have color, which has to do with light waves. It has to do, oh my gosh, um, you know, you have tints, you have hues, you have, I mean, literally all these, these phrases can overwhelm a beginner and that's something that I never want to do so what I do is I just think okay so let's think if you had a rubber ball a rubber ball a red rubber ball a black rubber ball and you look at it in your hand and you can see how the light depending on where it's positioned in 3d space remember I talked about that 3d environment that your brain has to has to comprehend we all live in a 3d environment so I don't know why it would be an issue but you look at the ball and you understand that the light will hit the top and it will go and wrap around that particular form, light, or I'm sorry, height, width, and depth. And there will be shadow areas, there'll be highlight areas, and there'll be mid values. So you have the highlights, you have the midtones uh, values, and then you have the shadows. So what I do, since I'm working on a gray background, that's kind of my mid value. And I go in and I just start sculpting the shadows where things are and that's all it is you, you can feel yourself as you are drawing you're wrapping the the hand of your mind and your eyeball your hand eyeball <laughs> eyeball hand and you're and you're feeling that inner part of the eye right here it goes in and then it comes out and then you have the cast shadow right here because i want the highlight to be right about here okay so that highlight so let's go ahead and we'll create a layer right here and we'll go ahead and switch gears and even if i were to go in and let's say i'm going to put the highlight right here suddenly the highlight's going to be here it's going to be here all right here you're going to have a little bit of a shadow or a highlight right there and as it and it goes further away from the source reflection it's going to get less intense <clears throat> okay so here here, we're going to have the top of the mustache. We're going to have a highlight there. Here, we're going to have the very tip of that. 
a little bit on the top of here. And you can see it hits, it, it, because light travels in a straight line, it is not only a wave, but it is also a particle. And you have all these highlights that are on top of these forms, right? Here's a little bit of a highlight right there, you know. You can see my machine's like, no, I don't want to do that. It's because I'm running OBS Studio. It's chewing on the resources. Hopefully it doesn't lose the, the uh, video and the touch and all of that. So you can see, basically, as I progress through, suddenly now it has form because we're starting to see those values, the highlights and the shadow values. And we're going to go back to our shadow layer. Okay, so we're going to start pushing and pulling those values a little bit more. The shadows here, we're going to push those in here, so on and so forth. And I'm doing this quickly because I want, you know, I want you to really see how quickly you can create an image and have it quote unquote look viable and real so let's go ahead and we'll add a layer and i always like to put in this, the highlights so up here we're going to have a little bit of highlight right here a little bit of highlight right here okay we're going to go ahead and select that we're going to make that darker okay so on and so forth Okay, making sure we don't have any stabilization. Okay, so I'm going to go to the right there. No, I don't want that. Where is my brush? The subtools. Where are the subtools? I'm embarrassing myself. Where do the subtools go? Did I put them over here? I was trying to increase the um, the pressure density of it because there is a pressure density curve that you can change I also have the pressure uh, a little bit it takes a little bit more force because that's kind of what I like I like drawing real light and then you know I have control over the amount of force uh, because I think the um, the defaults a little bit too much let's go ahead and have that down so now it's just a matter of you as the individual determining what you want to do and how you're going to progress uh, with this particular drawing. And, and what's cool, too, with Clip Studio Paint, very similarly to Photoshop, is as you, as you progress through creating layers, creating layer masks, it's got layer mask capability, it's got uh, layer transparency capability. Let's say if I want to go ahead and put some flesh in there. A little bit pinker. There we go. A little bit pinker there. I'll go ahead to paint. And you can see it's got just a myriad of of painting tools. I'll put that in there really quick. This is a color change. I don't even know. Let's go to oil paint. Yeah, I like oil paint. Let's do oil paint. Oil. Oil paint. You're like... He says oil. What? What's oil? I don't even know what that is. It's oil. Oil paint. I know how to speak. I took proper English in school. Proper talking. I live up here in the Appalachian Mountains, and we have a myriad of different people that have moved up here recently. So let's go ahead and do right here. That is the highlight. That's the general highlight. We're going to go ahead and put that on overlay. And there is a lot of different uh, accents up here. I say accent because that's the prevalent Appalachian um, tongue, accent. So let's go ahead and get a little bit pinker. And again, this is literally the quick and dirty. This is quick and dirty. I would do this if uh, I was you know, doing a concept and just a really quick sketch to help show the client or me what uh, this particular character would look like. 
with a little bit of flesh tone in here. So we can go here and we go multiply. That allows the uh, shadows um, to come through a little bit better. Okay, so here, you can see, and if I need to change the color, I use my quick and handy dandy. You can see as I progress through, I, I, I change the color very quickly. And if I mess up, I can, I can control Z. Yeah. So this is a fantastic program. And like I said, during the holidays, they have specials and deals they run. And you can get this program for, you know, under $30, routinely under $30. And then, of course, go in and find the brushes that, let me see here, subtool. I haven't done my subtool menu. I bet it's down here. Yeah, once you start getting into the ins and outs of this particular program, you can get, I don't want to say you can get lost, but... Man, you really need to watch it. <laughs> you can definitely find yourself in a place you're like, I don't want to make any of these changes. Yeah, so let's give him some brown eyes. Yeah, and one of the most useful tools inside of Clip Studio Paint is the color fill tool. I use it a lot. I'm talking pretty much almost exclusively. Um, no, I don't want to do that. Almost exclusively. And that is down here. So it's called the Direct Selection Tool uh, or Direct Draw. And it's the Lasso Fill. So whatever color you have. So let's say Cancel. Let's go. Let's go here. I can go ahead and get rid of my sketch. Yeah, that looks downright scary. Um, and I can use this tool to basically fill. And it will fill whatever color I have selected currently. So let's do that color. It's a little bit darker. And you see, I can go in and it will fill things very quickly. And I like this tool for doing turnarounds and character drawing and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and have it around. And what basically it's doing is I'm drawing and it's filling in the area. And what's nice is I'm filling, I'm filling, I'm going really fast. And I go ahead and change the color and I can come in and do some detail. Just fill really quickly. See how quickly that <laughs> it becomes it becomes viable very quickly, the drawing. You know. Yeah. Just very quickly. And I'm sure you can do this in Photoshop. But me likes me some clip studio paint. Yeah. Just very quickly. Just go in and press. Or I'm sorry, not press, but put in some values here and there. And then if you want to increase the, let's go ahead and do this. Let's color that in. Again, I'm selecting colors. Coming back, it changes. I still have the lasso fill and on the layer that I want. And you can really have some fun. And you understand why this particular program is so popular. You know, there we go. Kind of like the bad guy from... I forget what his name was. It wasn't Geppetto. That was the his dad. What was the bad guy's name? Pinocchio. Let's give him a little thing right here. Suddenly, he's very evil. And you put that beauty mark on him. <laughs> and then I come back and, you know, I'll place some. If I want to go ahead and put like a green background, you know, if I do just something simple. All right. This and I can change the opacity of that over here on the right hand side. Yeah, so that is what I wanted to show you guys today. Um, man, Clip Studio Paint, you know, I didn't go too depth deep in depth of this program. It's like I said, very similar to Photoshop, it's got a great rendering engine, great brush engine. Um, you know, it's, gosh, you know, you can do a lot of things very similar in here than you can in Procreate. And one of the things to note, and this is something you should put in your brain, if you work on multiple, uh, OS platforms, 
It does work on Mac. It does work on PC. And it works on Mac on the iPad, the full version. That's important in your brain, you need to know. Because Adobe's Photoshop on um, on the iPad Pro or iPad that supports Apple Pencil is not really the quote-unquote full version. It's very similar uh, to the desktop, but it's not the full version. This program is the full version of Clip Studio Paint on the iPad. And that's something you really need to look at and uh, understand if you work in that environment, right? And it works really well on the iPad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's important to me anyway to know that I can go and I can pick up my iPad and I can work on Clip Studio Paint or I can go on my PC, I can work on Clip Studio Paint and I can work on my Mac and it's Clip Studio Paint and it's the same interface it's the same program. It's the same everything. Now, within the confines of the OS, of course, it's hard to manage files in the iPad. Uh, you know, I don't care who you are. You know, if you've created a way to do that, kudos to you. Um, but for me, copying, pasting, finding files, installing fonts, installing brushes, having a, a resource area, it's just hard because the iPad is not really uh, designed as a desktop workstation. Um but Clip Studio Paint does a pretty good job of, uh, of helping you out. So, gosh, you know, what is this video today about? Today was talking and, and experiencing, um, you know, the way that, uh, you know, that I, in, in my brain, I'm trying to convey with my mouth how my thought process works whenever I'm in these programs. Um, these programs are tools. And you kind of have to look at them as tools. Some people will sit down and they'll say, oh, Photoshop, you just got to get in there. And you do the way, you know, you figure your own path and you you start doing your, your own thing, which is completely true. Don't we do that about everything? You know, we get in cars and I just drive the way I drive. You know, I walk the way that I walk. I put on clothes. You know, I put my shoe on the left foot first. And some people, you know, put it on the right foot and they're crazy. Uh but the reality is, is these programs are designed in such a way that, that, uh, you know, you can find your own path in your own way. And is my path in my own way the best? Probably not, but it is the one that works for me. And I'm constantly evolving and changing the way I do things. I can't, I remember once I was, uh, I had to go to a client's office to drop off files because back in the day, you know, the internet wasn't that good and transferring 1.5 gigabytes was not really possible. So I had to burn a CD and I had to, you know, transport it to their office. And I watched one of their artists work and I picked up like five different things while watching him. And I thought to myself, man, I've been doing it wrong the whole time. Crap. Well, that's not really a, uh, an accurate statement. I was doing it the way I was doing it the whole time. That is a more accurate statement. And he had found a more efficient way of doing what I needed to do. And that's what's great about these videos. You know, I, I encourage you. Man, I've got over 600 videos. And of course, I'm going to plug my channel because I want my channel to stick around and at least cover the cost of the time spent. I've got like over 600 videos of the way that I see the world and the way that I draw and that is important to know because I have over 20 years experience doing things and I've made a living at this for over 20 years. And is my way the best way? No, it is not. But it is a way that you can add to your way and your way then adds somebody else's way and then somebody else's way and then somebody else's way. There are so many artists out there now with video channels showing you how to do things. And man... Golly, it's insane. You can you can go to school online. You can learn how to be an animator. You can learn how to use After Effects. You can learn how to do 3D sculpting. I can't tell you how. I basically trained myself how to use ZBrush. I didn't go to school for it. Actually, I did. I went to the Mike School. <laughs> and the Mike School included like 500 videos of how to, how to do ZBrush. You know, um... I'm not saying that school isn't a viable option, but it's very expensive. And if you can find your path to the same result, if not better, it will be better because you won't have an enormous amount of money that was spent on that path. So definitely look around my channel, other channels, 
you know, we're constantly doing things different here at the channel. We're doing traditional artwork. We're doing paintings. We're doing reviews. I'm, I review a freaking lamp. I mean, I, who else does that? Why would you review a lamp? Because I know as a professional, when I start to do things, I need these tools. I need the lamps. I need the pencils. I need the quick key remotes. I need the computers. I need all these things not to inhibit my creativity. And if I can pass some of that on to you with an exuberance that you enjoy, that maybe I can throw some humor in there, you know, then my goodness, why wouldn't you subscribe? <laughs> manipulation i'm only kidding like and subscribe if you like what you see of course as always you know i encourage you to do something about that quest of being an artist being an artist is hard i'll be honest it is it's hard for me it's hard for me because of my personality I'm more or less an introvert with pockets of extrovert here and there out of necessity. I, I don't, I'm not really quote unquote a people person, but I am. It's like a dichotomy of, of, of uh, character, right? It's not even a dichotomy. It's like a multicotomy, <laughs> even if that's a, a phrase. But I encourage you, take the first step. My goodness, you know, here we are 2022. And... I can't tell you how many times people have, oh, I could never do that. Oh, I could never do that. I could never see myself doing that. And that is something you should never say out of your mouth, you know? Um, Steve Jobs, you know, I'm going to quote the great Steve Jobs, uh, as crazy as he was. He said, the world will open up to you when, and I'm not going to get the quote right. Let's just be honest. I'm not going to get it right because I don't have it in front of me. Um... The world will open up to you when you realize that all the things that you thought were unobtainable were created by people just like you, as smart as you, as creative as you. And the only thing that really stops you from success and getting what you want, because, you know, you're here, right? You saw the channel, you saw, you know, I started with basically nothing doing videos of time lapse. You have to take the first step. 2023 is your year. 2023 is your year. It is your year to start. It is your year to begin. It is your year to be something more. And I say that as an encouragement because I've been where you are. I know who, I don't know who you are, obviously, but I know where you've, where, where you've been, the ups and downs. That's what's so great about, you know, channels uh, like this one. I've had so many channels encourage me when I was so down. Imagine, 500 people quit today and you weren't one of them. 600 people quit today and you weren't one of them. You weren't one of them. Man, whenever you start looking at it that way, it starts becoming real. Start sewing into yourself. Start being more than you think you are because you are. Okay? All right. Thank you guys for visiting my channel, look around, learn something. We got a lot going on. 2023 is going to be a big year for us. I'm excited. All right. See you next time.